and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GPE News Docs, with guest James Galbraith. It's normally thought that large investments and in technological developments can ensure fast economic growth and prosperity. In the book The End of Normal, James Galbraith argues that while fixed capital and embedded technology may be essential in a capitalist system, rising resource costs can render any such arrangement fragile. As it's not possible to obtain cheap resources indefinitely, uh, be it domestically or from the rest of the world, notably the Global South, Galbraith argues that the U.S. needs to design institutions and policies to cope with rising resource costs. Not doing so has been one important reason that explains the shift from the American capitalism as described by John Kenneth Galbraith in his 1967 book, The New Industrial State, to an economy shaped by crises, institutional breakdowns, and predatory tendencies, as described by James K. Galbraith in his 2008 book, The Predator State. In today's program, James Galbraith analyzes this long-term transformation of the U.S. economy, describes its current state as a corporate republic in which finance has gained the upper hand and co-opted democratic institutions to forward its narrow interest. And he discusses solutions for the way forward, which will also reshape the future of growth. Joining us from Texas, our guest, James K. Galbraith, holds the Lloyd M. Benson Jr. Chair in Government and Business Relations and is Professor of Government at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin. A prolific author, James Galbraith's published works includes The End of Normal, Inequality and Instability, and The Predator State, among numerous other books. Welcome, James. Thank you. James, let's start with some context on the analysis of American capitalism presented in the end of normal. In in your words, this is the economics of organizations uh, developed by John Kenneth Galbraith, modified to emphasize that large complex systems are not only efficient, but also rigid. The economics of organizations is a concept uh, developed in the new industrial state, published by John Kenneth Galbraith, who, of course, was your father. So let's start there. Tell us something about that body of work and related terms like technostructure and countervailing power that John Kenneth Galbraith coined in his analysis of American capitalism. The New Industrial State was the culminating book of uh, a a, a trilogy, essentially, that my father started in 1952 and completed in uh, 1967. The the three books were were American Capitalism, the Concept of Countervailing Power, the Affluent Society, uh, and the New Industrial State. Uh, And what he developed in that that body of work was a, a portrait of how uh, uh, American capitalism actually worked. Uh, and it was clear that uh, it was an industrial capitalism that was rooted in the functioning of large organizations, of large industrial corporations, uh, they, uh, and, and not in uh, this notion that had really was a hangover from the 18th century of, of uh, you know, essentially independent uh, small businesses and farmers and so forth, all transacting uh, in, in uh, and where the, with the, with the so-called market as the dominant institution. You can't, do advanced uh, production, advanced manufacturing that way, because you have to have um, you have to have the mastery of particular of a whole raft of technologies. And in order to do that, you have to have specialists. In order to have specialists and use them, you have to you have to give them very specific things to do. Someone does the chemistry, someone does the metallurgy, someone does uh, the engineering, the hydrodynamics, and on and on and on. And, you know to bring these all together, and that has to happen in an organization. Uh, and then when the organization actually masters the technology, it has to have it has to figure out a way to present it to the public so the public is interested in buying it. It has to manage a regular Regulatory process. It has to has to deal has to finance has to manage the financial aspects. It has a whole range of functions uh, that go beyond the pure um, uh, matters of mastering the 
tech, uh, technical aspects of production. So the techno structure, which was, by the way, not my father's um, most felicitous coinage, and he was he was somewhat ambivalent about it as a as a word, uh, was is a group of people. Uh, who uh, make up as a as a uh, as a group the uh, the, the functioning brain of, of of a large organization, uh, and the one of the ideas in the new industrial state was that, that that this group of people were really the the governing force. They were the ones uh, uh, on whom the organization uh, uh, depended. Uh, that the, the the top manager, the person, the CEO, the so called entrepreneur uh, was. Was, uh, somebody who could be replaced, generally speaking. The board of directors didn't really do anything at all. It was a symbolic body. The shareholders had no role. Uh, people who actually ran the show were the people who knew how to fit the pieces together and could work together as a team. And that was the message of the new industrial state. And that was also the dominant feature of the whole American system. They had, on the one hand, you had the the alternative, which was uh, the Soviet Union, uh, which was uh, an industrial behemoth, but very centralized and uh, and very um, uh, uh, rigid, uh, and obviously at the end of the day, very fragile. Um, and on the other, you had the the developing world, uh, which didn't have the hadn't mastered the capacities that the American corporation had mastered. So the U.S. system at that time uh, was widely regarded as being the model toward which uh, effective um, uh, developmental strategies were, would, would be would be would be attempting to to, to trend. Uh, that, of course, all all of that is has changed. The world does not stay still, and nobody captures it for any indefinite period of time. Give us more background on the development of the U.S. system, and uh, what were the periods that actually spanned um, your father's portrait of American capitalism? Well, the development of the system does start really in in the early 1930s. It starts with 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 Roosevelt's New Deal. I mean, you had an earlier system which was very unstable, which went through an explosive period of growth in the 1920s and then collapsed. Uh, and the collapse didn't go away. It lasted for four very long and painful years uh, in which they, uh, the factories were idle and the uh, people uh, in, on, on the farms could, couldn't sell their products. And uh, there was mass migration and all kinds of an ecological disaster. The, the Roosevelt and the New Deal create created an entirely uh, different structure within which the American economy could function. Um, and that was a that was a federal project and it culminated in the uh, um, in the vast industrial mobilization at the time of the Second World War. So the period my father's describing really picks up, uh, from that, I would say from the early 1940s, uh, when he himself actually played an important role, he was the it was the uh, deputy administrator for prices of the Office of Price Administration. So he controlled uh, you know, all, all basically every price in America for a period of a year, um, and uh, then he went on and. To, to, to describe the system that he then ha that he'd had to deal with and that was evolving in the 40s and into the 50s. It's about managing the uncertainties associated with advanced technology. It's about having organizations that are stable, that provide livelihoods that are stable. It's about organizations that are responsive to multiple constituencies, the public sector, to um, to the consumer sector, to, uh, uh, to uh, various uh, outside forces. So it's about the balance of things in society as the concept of countervailing power. Um, and, um, and it's about, yes, it's about, it's about having essentially a world in which you have some economic predictability, not only for the organizations, but for the people who work for them and for the larger community. Uh, and again, all of that uh, uh, was certainly the, the, the way the system uh, appeared to be functioning uh, into the 60s and in, into the 70s when it began to run into you know, the kinds of serious difficulties which have been uh, a feature of life for the last 50 years. As you get into in the end of normal and the post-war era, e economists were living in a kind of a dream world because the dominant economic ideology basically obliterated the analysis of resource costs from economic growth theory. And this growth model then just assumed, um, as you say, that the rapid uh, 
economic growth performance of that period could be pursued indefinitely and extend it to everybody. And one of the consequences being that the U.S. post-war economic system uh, didn't get built to cope with rising resource costs and the implications of which uh, didn't surface until cheap resources um, that had enabled growth in the post-war era were no longer so cheap uh, in the 1970s. A couple of distinct points here. Um, the early 1970s uh, were characterized by some uh, sort of epochal uh, changes. Uh, first one in, in 1970 itself was the uh, peak uh, at, in conventional oil production in the United States, which meant that from that point forward, we were increasingly dependent upon uh, imported uh, oil, Middle Eastern oil. Uh, in 1971, the uh, exchange rate system that had been developed uh, after World War II broke down, was, was dismantled by, by, by President Nixon. The dollar was devalued, uh, and you had uh, the beginning of a period of, 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 um, of substantial instability. Uh, this led in, uh, in 1973, uh, to a big increase in, 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 the, in the price of oil. And that was the first energy crisis. Uh, and what did that do? That meant that uh, a great many uh, uh, American industries, which had been built uh, on the you know, high levels of, of energy consumption, now had very high costs uh, compared to other industrial structures that were more recent uh, or that were being built at that time, uh, which could be built uh, to adjust to the to the higher levels of of of, of energy costs, uh, which was true of 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 uh, the automobile industry in Japan, for example. Um, uh, so always, since Japan didn't have uh, a, you know, a great reserve, it didn't come out of the war with a great reserve of 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 uh, cheap energy. It always had to be conscious of that in building up uh, the, the kinds of uh, industrial uh, automobile industry, for example, that it that it built. And so it was it was in some sense like better adapted to the new environment. Um, and here you had two different or two, um, let's say, industrial systems, uh, which uh, have, were organized by different corporations under different governmental structures, which were in alliance with each other, but were also in competition. And from that point forward, you began to see this real incursion of uh, German, Japanese, later Korean, and then finally, um, much later on, the, the Chinese uh, industrial uh, uh, organizations and, and production structures and products into the American market. And they tended to, to displace those parts of the American industry, which were older or organized under the, what the principles that had been advantageous in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and you got a kind of deindustrialization uh, that uh, uh, that occurred in the United States that was then greatly accelerated uh, in the 1980s by the way economic policy was managed. I'll just interject for viewers here that we can't possibly do justice to the full breadth of your analysis, least of all uh, the international uh, dimension. but. I'll just note here that as well as hollowing out the U.S. industrial core, the way U.S. economic policy was managed in the, in the 80s set off a debt crisis that went around the world for two decades and was especially devastating for the developing countries in the global south. But talk now about the financialization of the U.S. economy following this period of accelerated deindustrialization in the 1980s. So, after the industrial core of the United States, so basically that means the agro-industrial middle-class economy from the 1930s to the 1970s was gone. So what then emerged in the 1990s? I published a book in 1989 whose subtitle was Technology, Finance, and the American Future, which uh, I think captured uh, what was about to happen or what was already already happening at that point. The economy that returned uh, in the context of the 1990s was a very different economy. Uh, it was dominated uh, by, uh, by global finance, uh, which was headquartered, of course, in New York and on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, its major industrial element in the United States was no longer the in the upper Midwest and no longer basic consumer goods manufacturing, uh, but 
uh, um, the technology sector, which is uh, much more located on the West Coast. So you had you had aerospace, you had uh, information technology, uh, you had armaments, you had the entertainment industry. Uh, these things uh, uh, prospered under these uh, conditions. They were highly oriented toward global markets, uh, and they uh, they were also strongly backed by the by the financial sector. Uh, so those two things became the, in some sense, the the, the controlling uh, the dominant elements uh, in 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 the uh, American place in the world economy, uh, with a great many of the consumer goods uh, coming in from uh, overseas in a way they had not done before. Well, that gives us an overview of how American capitalism evolved from the post-war era into the 1990s. So as further context to the 1990s, let's bring the Soviet Union into the picture here. Earlier in the conversation, you said that the late Soviet Union was an industrial behemoth, but very centralized and very rigid. And so obviously at the end of the day, very fragile, notably uh, because it was a single integrated high fixed cost system which operated with very little flexibility. So the question being, do you see any convergence between the late Soviet model and what happened to the United States? Well, there was certainly uh, in both systems a, uh, you know, there's, this, there's a, a process of obsolescence and of uh, the, let's say, the downfall of industrial systems that were built up in the first half of the 20th century that were no longer uh, effective uh, under the conditions in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, so that's certainly true. Uh, the uh, situation in the Soviet Union was um, you know, much more dire because, among other things, the entire country collapsed in 1991. Uh, and uh, that broke apart uh, uh, industrial chains of production, which previously been within one country, be had to cross international frontiers when the international frontiers turned hostile in some cases, it, the, the system no longer works. The same thing happened, by the way, in Yugoslavia. Um, so that that's and and the, and, this, and the Soviet system was was more brittle and important otherwise. So it suffered a, a really serious, much more calamitous collapse. This was a system which, although it had many inefficiencies, um, it was uh, a, a system designed to take advantage of certain kinds of efficiency, particularly very large scale operations, steel plants, automobile plants, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was what generated the fragility uh, that led to this uh, breakdown in, 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 uh, at the end of the Soviet period, uh, from which Russia, by the way, over 20 years has, has substantially now recovered. But, uh, uh, but that was the situation at the time. But what happened in the United States was not of, of, a, of an entirely different type. Uh, it's just that the U.S. had um, you know, elements that were able to recover uh, and maintain their position uh, in the world economy. And again, the dominant ones, finance, technology. Uh, but they were located in very different parts of the country. So you had uh, essentially a large area of economic um, stagnation and decay. Uh, and that, of course, has had, has political consequences. It's, uh, it's what led ultimately. It's a, what what Donald Trump was able to seize upon in 2016 and carried him to the presidency. Um, and before that, it was the, the, these developments were what, for example, had carried Bill Clinton to the presidency. His strength was in the was in the on the on the east coast, east coast uh, on the west coast, and bringing that into the Democratic Party. This was the the, the, uh, the, the each each of these economic Economic developments has a has a has a political uh, corollary which you can trace very easily. Let's turn now to the shift from the form of American capitalism described by your father in the new industrial state to what you describe in the predator state as a corporate republic. So talk now about your argument that when weakened by adversity, the U.S. model was destabilized from within and made vulnerable to fraud, predation, and looting. Yeah, well, here, here, here is another case where we're going to talk a little bit about convergence between the late Soviet model and what happened to the United States. And the, and the Soviet Union, when it was no longer profitable, uh, no longer possible to um, 
uh, you know, to to produce uh, in the or in the previously existing structures, the people who uh, had control of the assets liquidated them. They they uh, it was was called the the privatizing nomenclatura. There was a, there were um, they simply enriched themselves uh, at, at the expense of the previously existing system, the expense of everybody who had been dependent upon it. Uh, so you had uh, this contributed rather. Uh, greatly to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the to the social um, distress and and um, into the collapse of life expectancy and so forth in the Soviet the late Soviet period and um, in the in the in the United States uh, the, what I described in my 2008 book the Predator State uh, was something about essentially a parasitism on the public institutions uh, that had um, uh, developed, been developed in the New Deal and the Great Society. Uh, and the, the argument I was making was that uh, we had a very, very robust uh, social insurance, social stabilizing institutions, including uh, um, Social Security, Medicare, uh, and what could go down the, down the list. And you do, a, a certain politics emerged out of that Free market conservatives might say we want to get rid of these things, we want to privatize them, we want to dismantle them altogether. That isn't really what they were after. Uh, what they what they realized in this age of of, of particularly George W. Bush and, and Dick Cheney uh, was that they could um, they could they could make certain parts of their constituency quite happy by skimming. Uh, essentially, by taking uh, some of the resource flow and directing it uh, to the narrow constituencies that supported them. So, this was the, the case, for example, of, uh, of 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 Medicare Part D, which is the drug benefit that was a, a major expansion of Medicare that occurred under the under the the Bush administration. It became it's become a very complicated system with a lot of private drug companies making a lot of money off of selling pharmaceuticals to senior citizens uh, in the United States who pay an enormous amount that's just unheard of, certainly in Europe, in terms of what these, what these uh, medicines cost. Uh, and that's not accidental. Uh, the whole idea here is that you, 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 you get uh, a, a private sector support uh, for the larger program uh, by enriching a small uh, group of people. Uh, at the expense of uh, of the larger public, uh, it's not a system anybody would design rationally, but from a political standpoint, it makes sense and it's understandable that uh, uh, that a, a, a that any kind of uh, let's say an administration with the ethics of the George W. Bush administration would 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 pursue that route. Um, so we saw quite a lot of that, uh, and essentially. Uh, uh, as I say, we're not undoing the, uh, the, the, the the public sector, but converting it into an instrument that also greatly enriched private interest. That said, one also had uh, in the in the strictly private sector um, a um, there's nothing quite like I wouldn't call anything strictly private, but in the corporate sector, this we also went through a period of basically the dismantling of going concerns in order to enrich um, shareholders and corporate executives who were able to self-deal uh, with, with stock options and, and, and buybacks. And the whole business of private equity is, is, is largely concerned with that, how you get, how you load up an organization with debt in order basically to walk off with a great deal of the, uh, of the asset value. Um, and so you see a great deal of that going on as well. You distinguish between those nations that continued along the lines that once defined U.S. economic success, as described by John Kenneth Galbraith, in contrast to those that, like the U.S. and U.K., shifted to the opposing Friedman doctrine of the economics of markets. Prominent examples of nations that continued along the lines of the Galbraithian economics of organizations being Germany, Japan, South Korea, and China. So comment on uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's influence in that respect, and specifically in the case of China. 
Well, uh, to begin with, it was it wasn't my father who directly advised the Chinese. I actually I did that uh, in the 1990s. I had for four years a position uh, uh, under the, the consultancy under the United Nations Development Program as chief technical advisor to the State Planning Commission for Macroeconomic Reform. Uh, it was a mostly a, a, an exercise in providing training and uh, um, and exposure to the people who were working there, uh, rather than direct policy. Advice. Uh, my the, the interesting thing, though, is that when I got there in 1993, I got a whiff of a fact uh, that I've later confirmed through the work of um, uh, of a young economist named Isabella Weber, who's written on this in a very important book uh, about China. Uh, that uh, the uh, you know the, the people I was dealing with were very very familiar, especially. Uh, with the American experience with price control in the Second World War, uh, which was my father's doing. And, and the, the things that they knew about it were what he'd written about it. They, they had his books. They'd been translated internally. They'd studied them. Uh, and so they, this fed into, uh, if you like, the historic Chinese uh, economic management, uh, which has always been about stabilizing prices. Uh, agricultural prices, and then the, the new problem was industrial prices. And that's where they drew on my father's work. That approach is completely opposite to the idea in Western economics that the prices are supposed to adjust and that the markets are supposed to, you know, let them go up and down and do whatever. No, that's just not the, not the way it works uh, in in the has in thousands of years of Chinese history. The emperors always bought the the uh, 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 you know the grain when it was cheap and sold it when it was expensive in order to in order to um, uh, keep the keep the peasants uh, from from rising up in revolt. Uh, and by and large, it worked. Uh, so uh, it's, this is a, 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 a big difference. Uh, in terms of, I characterize the, the uh, economies of a number of countries as Galbraithian. Uh, Germany, uh, where you have co-determination, you have strong unions, and you have a, a, a kind of collaboration between the industrial and the union and the government sectors, at least in the, in the traditional part of the German economy. Um, in uh, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, and I think China fits under this rubric as well, in which uh, fundamentally the driving forces in the economy are industrial organizations, corporations, some of them state-owned, some of them private, some of them joint ventures, some of them foreign, uh, but they maintain long-term objectives. They're not quick buck operations. Uh, the government has been quite careful to prevent or to restrain the tendency for asset stripping that comes up in capitalist systems. And China has a very substantial capitalist system. The notion that it's a communist country is uh, you know, not something that's recognized by anybody who knows it well. This is the big difference: is that uh, it's not it's not a country which where where the where the equivalent of Wall Street uh, uh, runs the show. Uh, it does have its own financial sector, uh, and the government has been quite careful to keep it uh, from uh, taking on the kind of overwhelming importance uh, that the financial sector has in the United States or the United Kingdom. And that's a big difference. That's 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 a Galbraithian feature if you like, of the, of the Chinese system. And how is China coping with rising resource costs? Well, the Chinese have been planning uh, for uh, the resource issues and acting on those plans. That's what the Belt and Road Initiative is largely about. It's about building uh, pipelines and rail lines and so forth that will supply ports uh, and mines and so forth and uh, resource producing countries. Uh, that will uh, establish reliable supply lines so that the so that China will can can navigate uh, uh, what they anticipate to be a period of of rising resource costs because they know they have to reduce their reliance on coal. Coal is the cheap uh, fuel, uh, but if you're going to use uh, gas, you've got to get it from you got to get it from Russia or from Central Asia. Uh, and uh, the other things that one needs are going to come from other parts of the world, Africa notably. And so you see the Chinese going out there and saying, hey, we'll build you ports and airports and so forth, rail lines, roads, um, and, um, uh, and making these deals. And they're doing this very much in their own, in their own interest, in the interest of a, some long-term stability of their, of, 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 of their supply lines. Um, they, uh, so that uh, we, 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 
we accuse them of having lots of other motives, but it seems to me that uh, they, this is clearly the dominant motive of, of Chinese engagement in the developing world. In contrast, then, to a number of countries that you characterize as Galbraithian, in the U.S., Wall Street runs the show. And your argument is that the U.S. Uh, needs to move to a qualitatively different form of capitalism, and a new approach to economics uh, is needed for that to happen. And your own approach is to treat the economy as having the same form as a biophysical system. So tell us something about that. This is an argument that I've developed in conjunction with a, uh, with a uh, colleague of mine, Jing, Jing Chen. Um, and it is, it's rooted in the most basic uh, you know, physical principles uh, uh, that in order to uh, extract resources efficiently, you have to invest. Uh, there's no other way of doing it. And there's the large scale investments are the most efficient ones. Um, and when resource costs so low, it just pays. Uh, it pays to build when you have a large free flowing river with coming through a canyon with a lot of energy available. It pays to build a big hydroelectric dam. Uh, and that's a, that's a resource and that's a, a, a capital intensive uh, enterprise. Um, and one can go down the list of things of that, of that kind. Um, the uh, uh, consequence of doing that is that when the resource costs go up, uh, then uh, you're in uh, somewhat you're in a dangerous situation. Uh, they, uh, and uh, that's that's sort of in the, in the nature. It's in the nature of every physical, biological, mechanical system. Uh, it's it, it's not accidental that the that the largest animals have the biggest range and the most diverse diets and so forth. But it's also not accidental that they're the ones who are endangered, uh, and that they're the ones who uh, you know who are who are at risk of climate changes. Talk more about the basic physical principles in this approach that treats the economy as having the same form as a biophysical system. In other words, what all that means. Well, it, it means that you have to build the economy in conjunction with the environment of which it's a part, both the resource environment and the uh, uh, what's available in terms of the of the biosphere for absorbing the the waste products of economic activity, uh, and those two things have to be have to be uh, you know. Uh, treated as, as of, of, of really great importance, which we haven't been doing. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of how economics should be taught and understood, it seems to me that, that giving everybody a grounding in the basic thermodynamics of this uh, is uh, vital. And understanding that the economics that is in the textbooks is a kind of an 18th century idealization. It's really pre-scientific. Uh, it, it is, uh, it is, if you like, it has a theological aspect. It's sort of deist. That's what Adam Smith was. Uh, uh, the, the, the idea of, a, in some sense, it's the intelligent design view of the economic world, which uh, was superseded in scientific understanding already in the middle of the 19th century by, by uh, Darwin and an evolutionary perspective. Uh, so what I'm building on and suggesting is that one should really start with the essence of an evolutionary perspective and get people to understand what that entails. Explain more about that. So give us some context on what an evolutionary perspective entails. First of all, we have to recognize we have some obligations to the planet. Uh, those obligations are to move away from um, the cheap and dirty fuels uh, and to create systems uh, that uh, are sustainable over a long period of time. This is a, partly an engineering problem, but it also is a question of resource allocation. And you're going to have to put resources into that to make it happen. It's not something, uh, economists talk rather glibly about carbon taxes and say, okay, if we can get the price of using carbon up, but it doesn't work that way. People, have, people who own a, a gasoline powered car uh, can't, immediately uh, switch to something else. It's, it's not as though they have a horse in the backyard that doesn't <laughs> emit, uh, you know, carbon dioxide. Uh, it's, uh, so uh, one, has to, one has to build systems that are functional. And, and in order to do that, 
you have to commit resources. In order, if you're committing resources, you're going to have a lot of things that are you're using resources for uh, that are not immediately consumable. Um, and they will yield benefits down the road. And so you have to manage that transition. Is it entirely new? No, nothing's entirely new. This is part of the problem that was dealt with uh, in, um, in, in, in the Second World War. And it was part of the problem that was dealt with in the construction of the infrastructure of the country in the, in the New Deal. Let's talk more about your argument that in order to move to a qualitatively different form of American capitalism, a new approach to economics, and so economic growth strategy, uh, is needed. By now, most everybody recognizes the problem of boom-bust economic growth. And your critique of finance-driven growth and the role the wave of financial fraud played in the 2008-2009 Great Financial Crisis is also widely recognized. Of special relevance to this conversation is your argument that these financial frauds were the culminating phase of efforts to preserve the post-war rapid economic growth performance. So the culminating phase of decades of, of efforts, basically from the 1970s, when American capitalism ran into serious difficulties. And as discussed earlier, uh, the post-war era of easy growth enabled by cheap resources ended with the rise of resource costs in the 1970s. So to have another stab at some of the underlying insights of your critique of efforts to uh, sustain high economic growth, I'll very quickly cite from your book, uh, The End of Normal. In your words, a high growth strategy favors capital investment a substitution of capital and energy for labor, and fosters increased inequality in a winner-take-all system. You point out that finance and technology, two sectors that dominate this winner-take-all system, simply don't provide a large base of direct employment. So focus for a moment on the issue of productive employment under this high growth model. One thing we can all understand is a low use of labor compared with machinery and resources has implications for working people. Taking the case of labor-saving technology, talk about how the advanced technology sector is accelerating a decline in the base of productive employment. This is a, a feature of the, of, of the, essentially, the wave of technologies that we've uh, been in the midst of for the last 25 or 30 years at least. Um, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. If you look at what happened in the early 20th century, uh, a great many things that were provided within the household were outsourced to uh, machines. Transportation was one of them. My father grew up on a farm where the, where the plowing was done by teams of horses. Uh, and uh, you didn't need a gas station. <laughs> you didn't need a mechanic. Uh, they, uh, this, these were replaced by tractors and the, uh, the carriage into town was replaced by the automobile. And a whole body of not just the employment producing these vehicles, but maintaining them and the roads and the and the fuel systems and everything else grew up. So the system was adding uh, employed paid jobs. And one could go through a lot of inside things that happened inside the house as well, uh, that you know, cooking and cleaning and so forth, or were became mechanized and became the objects of employment providing industries. Well, this is not what the digital world is doing, it seems to me. What the digital world is doing and the digital revolution is doing is working out ways to, uh, to reduce the labor content of a whole range of things. I mean, we can go down the, the go down the enormous lists, but a lot of clerical work, a lot of uh, accounting work, a lot of communications. Uh, the, obviously, the information and um, and the entertainment sectors and all kinds of things. Uh, what we're doing right now, which is talking over a, a digital link. Uh, would have only a few years ago required uh, airfares, hotels, uh, restaurant bills, uh, all kinds of things in order to do this. Um, and even the, the, the underlying, you know, tech, you know, recording technologies existed for for, for many decades. Uh, so one can see that the the, you know, kind of the the ancillary labor requirements 
uh, are um, you know they're being reduced, which is not a bad thing. Uh, it means that lots of things are becoming accessible, simple, um, simple and inexpensive to uh, to do that were previously really quite expensive and difficult. But it does mean that we have to adjust. Uh, we have to work out things for people to do uh, that are um, and that are not not automated. Uh, and there are many things that you know, life can go on in a very agreeable way. In fact, can be improved dramatically provided uh, that the economy is able to give uh, means of subsistence, make incomes flow uh, for doing those things. And if the, uh, you know, the, this, the industrial model isn't going to be providing a lot of jobs, then we have to have institutions that do. Uh, and uh, cooperatives are an example, and uh, you know, decentralized pu public sector structures of one kind or another are an example. The tax system can be mobilized to 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 assist this. We just have to put our minds to it. What you're describing basically means turning the prevailing high growth strategy on its head uh, to what you call a slow growth strategy, which is not a, a slowed down version of the high growth strategy, but instead, um, as you explained, to quickly cite from the end of normal once again, a slow growth strategy should instead foster a qualitatively different form of capitalism based on decentralized economic units with relatively low fixed costs, relatively high use of labor compared with machinery and resources, and relatively low rates of return but mutually supported by a framework of labor standards and social protections. I stand by those words. But I think one does need to recognize that, the, that some parts of that economy are going to be of a very high fixed cost variety. Uh, the entities that uh, actually create the information networks, these are, these are laying down fixed cost systems. Uh, the entities that can, will continue to provide uh, manufactured goods, they may not be very large in terms of the scale of employment, uh, but they will be very, uh, uh, in, uh, very, very um, concentrated and in their use of, of capital and technology. Otherwise, they won't be able to do this. They're going to be complex, concentrated, uh, and uh, effectively centrally organized. There's no, I think, a way around that in the modern world. You don't, you don't want to have excessively duplicative network structures beyond what you need to a certain amount of resiliency. Uh, so uh, there is an illusion uh, about, uh, which I would associate with at least some of the people who are the advocates of this so-called new antitrust, that the problem is concentration or per se, uh, and that the way to deal with this is to establish competition, uh, to have many, many units uh, that are effectively all trying to do the same thing. Uh, and this is not an effective way to organize, for example, a communication network. If you had 10 Facebooks or 10 Googles, uh, they, you know, nine of them would not last for very long, no matter what you did. Uh, so one has, uh, one, one, has to set, one has to really push back against the idea that the 18th century economic idea had it right. Uh, the 18th century, that idea uh, is, was already out of date with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so, one, one, what is what is the right approach? I think the right approach is again a Galbraithian approach. It's a, it is to recognize the need for countervailing power, to recognize the, the need for uh, a public purpose, uh, and for effective and autonomous regulatory structures that can make these large entities, um, you know, serve serve a public interest. And that you have to recognize there is such a thing as a public interest. It needs to be defined in a coherent way. Uh, it needs to be respectful of, uh, you know, of, of individual rights uh, um, and, and, not, and not protected from, from abuse. Uh, but there is a public there is a public purpose and there is a public interest and some uh, entities and institutions need to represent it. And so you really have to have people looking who are competent, who are trained, who are dedicated, who are imbued with a public spirit, uh, who have enforcement authority, uh, 
setting a set of rules and making and trying to ensure that they're actually respected. By the way, this is most especially true of the financial sector. If the financial sector is controlling its own regulations, uh, then you're going to end up with one financial crisis and disaster after another. Uh, and the only way to avoid that that actually works is uh, that has a demonstrated record of working is to have uh, a set of regulatory institutions that are fully independent uh, and that have the real authority over the behavior of the large financial institutions and can keep them uh, uh, from uh, essentially abusing the enormous control and authority that they have over, over the extension of loans and the, what effectively is to make creation of money. So in the end of normal, you analyze the breakdown of law and ethics in the financial sector as one of four major obstacles to sustainable growth and full employment in the U.S. Two others being, uh, as we discussed, the rising costs of real resources and the labor-saving consequences of the digital revolution. Talk now about the fourth, what in, in your words is the now evident futility of military power. A great deal, at least a strong part of the deep backbone of the American economy uh, in the post-war period uh, was furnished by, a, by, by, by the military position of the United States, uh, by, the, by the security environment that was built up, uh, it merged out of the war and then was built up in the Cold War. Uh, and then in the aftermath of the Cold War, it got completely out of hand. Uh, there was an idea uh, that the United States was the sole superpower, was going to essentially provide the guarantee of world security, uh, and uh, an idea that the U.S. military was the only was the hyperpower, the one that nobody would stand up to. Uh, it's now thirty years down the road from the, those the emergence of those ideas in the early 1990s. And we see that they are both uh, in tatters. They have both been uh, effectively refuted. Uh, the, uh, uh, the United States is not being accepted as the sole guarantor of global security. Uh, and in fact, uh, strong powers have emerged, uh, which uh, are not going to accept it uh, and insist that the will be organized on uh, principles that are that are multilateral. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's been demonstrated that uh, for all of its uh, you know, professional uh, commitments and so forth, the American military uh, was unable uh, to prevail in Afghanistan and it was unable uh, to prevail on a sustained basis in Iraq. Uh, and uh, it's quite clear, and I, I actually uh, was invited to a give this presentation in 2004 to a group of American military officers in Germany. Uh, and I, I made the point, uh, which I developed in the book, that they uh, that in the modern world, um, the military advantage is with the defense. Uh, it's with those who control their own territory, uh, because uh, first of all, it's technology. Secondly, it's um, uh, it, it's it's the expectation uh, that at the end of the day, um, the, the, they're going to be the ones who are going to still be there, that nobody's going to stay on somebody else's territory indefinitely. Um, and so uh, we shouldn't expect that the security arrangements for the world uh, can be like what we imagine, what some people imagine they would be 30 years ago. We have to come to grips with this. It means we really should uh, for our own sake and for the sake of our economy, completely reconfigure our, 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 our military posture We recognize lots of things that we have are, complete, are not, are not going to be useful. Uh, and we need to build a, a global security framework which takes account of the, of the emerging, uh, of the, I wouldn't say emerging, of the power centers that have emerged. Uh, uh, which we need to we need to accept and deal with. Uh, we did that, you know, did, did this in the in the Cold War when the Soviet Union was a uh, uh, was the essentially the the, the major um, security uh, partner adversary, however you want to describe it. Uh, a, a, a essentially a balance of power, uh, not a particularly happy one, but one which which kept uh, conflict to uh, you know, down did develop. Uh, we need to recognize that we're not going to we're not going to escape 
uh, having to do that again. Uh, and that, you know, like the countries that you deal with, but that's not the point. <laughs> you have to deal with them, uh, and you have to you have to provide come to the best security arrangements you can achieve. Uh, you can't pretend that we're that it's within our power to prevent that. Uh, so. I, I think that main, understanding that uh, is is an element actually of a sensible economic development strategy because when you free up the resources that you don't that you've been putting um, unproductively into um, into let's say armaments technology and into and into the into the um, the, the human uh, uh, parts of the uh, of, of the military establishment and into the bases that we maintain everywhere. Uh, then you then you have resources that you can you can mobilize for other purposes where you where they can be more effectively used for the benefit of everybody. This then, as you say, would be an element of a sensible economic development strategy. And as we're we're talking about the U.S., that's uh, you use the word development uh, strategy in the context of a high income advanced economy. So this would be an element that's part of a constellation of policy advice that uh, you've developed as the way forward for the U.S. So as we're wrapping up, give us an idea of the main thrust of all this. So what are some of the main objectives of these policy solutions? In terms of policy, uh, and I am by and large, a policy economist and uh, not so much a high theorist. Um, in terms of policy, since you recognize that resource constraints are going to be there and you have to deal with them, um, that one should orient consumption patterns so far as possible toward uh, uh, things that can be enjoyed collectively uh, by as, as toward public goods. In other words, uh, the quality of the environment. In other words, is a, is a is a substitute for the accumulation of privately held objects uh, and something which can be provided. I think at considerably more resource efficiency. Uh, than, um, than than the current system works, uh, and that, for example, it, true of transportation networks, for example, is just a very important uh, element in this. Uh, so that's 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 one thing. And the second thing I think you need to recognize is that what we need to recognize is that uh, in an economy in which material goods are produced by very small numbers of people, uh, and often not. Uh, on the, within the boundaries of the country consuming them, then you need to provide a strong and ro a very robust uh, security, uh, uh, social insurance, and personal security, uh, security of food, of housing, of retirement, uh, access to education, cultural opportunities uh, to the to the uh, to the broad population. That was that was the, the what you know the great accomplishment of the New Deal to get that process started. It's by no means complete, uh, but it gives people the chance to lead. Uh, you know, fulfilling lives to take a certain amount of personal risk because uh, they're insured against uh, against the, some of the worst outcomes. Uh, to be assured that they will get health care when they need it, uh, and protect people from the kind of uh, against again what is against essentially against the forces of financial rapacity that inflict them with student debt, with um, with with, with health care debt. Um, with old age and security, uh, these things are, are things we ought to be trying to, to, to banish. James Galbraith, thank you. Thank you. And from Geneva, Switzerland, thank you for joining us in this segment of GB News Docs.